We'll get started. So, here we are at the end of 13 weeks, 50 chapters of the book of Genesis, and we have a week with no specific content to cover. We've covered our 50 chapters. This is sort of the wrap, the conclusion. And uh, I'll be honest, I, I wrestled a little bit with like, what do you do with the wrap? I mean, we just finished this whole working through all these chapters, and we did have an introduction week, so I sort of gave a little overview on in the introduction, and I didn't want to be repetitive and, and just sort of hit highlights of, of what we've covered. So this is a grand experiment, and it's going to be really up to you on whether or not this works this week. If it doesn't work, I'm going to make AJ come up here and answer questions from you. So uh, he's, he's cheering you on. You have in front of you, I think, if you don't, wave at me, a chart. Looks like this. God, man, Christ, response. Everybody got one of those? What I'd like you to do is open your Bibles to the book of Romans. In week one, when we did sort of the summary overview of the book of Genesis, I made this statement. All the stained glass pieces of Genesis are pieced together in a powerful, loving, by a powerful, loving, promise-keeping God. In so doing, he provides us with a picture of mankind in a downward spiral of sin, a God of grace and mercy who is working his plan for redemption, we are given the promise of a coming Savior who will provide a way of escape to the glory of God. And as we journey through this book, we will learn from the historical narrative with an eye on what is to come in the days ahead. We will see God weaving together his plan, and I trust the end result will be all praise and glory to God for, for who he is and what he has done. We'll find out whether or not we accomplish that this week. Romans chapter 1. I'm going to go through in Romans outlining key pieces. This is not meant to be an exhaustive uh, review of all the facets of the gospel. You can't do that in one week. You can't do that in several weeks. But I'm going to hit some key highlights of the gospel through the book of Romans and you're going to tell me where we learned those principles or saw them exhibited in the book of Genesis. You with me? Just shake it off, get the blood flowing, get your minds working, because if it doesn't, we're done in about 15 minutes and you've got an early lunch. Okay? So think this through a little bit. Romans chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 16. Romans 1.16, we're going to focus here on what it tells us about God. Starting in verse 16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For it is the righteousness of God revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. Romans tells us, first of all, that God's wrath is revealed against ungodliness. And that the unrighteousness of men is manifested in the behavior of suppressing the truth. Man is unrighteous for the suppression of the truth. Romans tells us, God, what we know about God can be plainly seen in creation. Specifically what? What two things does Romans tell us specifically that we know we can know about God just by creation? His eternal power, right? And his divine nature. 
Now, there's other things that we could gather from God in the observation of creation. I don't know that that's an exhaustive list. But at minimum, it is very clear, looking at creation, we see that God is, is powerful, and we see that He is divine. Right? What we know about God can be plainly seen as creation. Romans 5, well, let's, let's stop there. I'll, 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 we'll go to Romans 5 in a minute. Where do we see those truths that we just read in Romans and Genesis? Yeah, most right all of, certainly gen, all of Genesis 1 and 2, the, the whole creative act, right? Genesis 1:1 1, 1 says what? In the beginning, God put a period there for a minute. What do we know about God? His divine nature. He's eternal. He pre-existed creation. In the beginning, God, period. Then it goes on. The next two chapters are going to tell us all that he created. And he created those things out of nothing. By his spoken word. Genesis has already told us that in creation, you see at minimum God's divine nature and his power. He's eternal and all powerful. Romans chapter, I mean Genesis chapter 3, here's, here's, here's a thought. I said the unrighteousness of men in Romans chapter 1 is displayed in the suppression of truth. Do we see that in Genesis? Where do we see it in Genesis? Yeah, at minimum, Genesis 3, the serpent is twisting God's truth. Adam and Eve make decisions on the basis of not accepting or acknowledging God's truth. We'll get to that more when we talk specifically about man, right? So if you're filling in anything on your chart there, you can start putting down some of these truths about God and give the Romans reference if you want. Remind yourselves of what the Genesis references are that go with, go with that. Any other thoughts? Nice and loud. The flood account, and what's that going to show? Okay. The flood account displaying the wrath of God that is against the unrighteousness of man in his judgment. Are we making connections here? All right, here's another one. Romans 5. Turn over to Romans chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 6. Romans 5, 6 says... For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 6 through 8. What does that tell us about God? Who initiates the relationship between God and man? In Romans 5, God does. In his love for us, while we were sinners, while we were not worthy, while we were not seeking him, while we had nothing to do with him and didn't have a thought of him, he loved us enough to die for us. Where do we see God initiating the relationship in Genesis? Do we see the God of initiative in Genesis? Well, he created Adam and Eve. Okay, so there's the obvious. Where else do we see God initiating? Pardon? Abraham. God spoke to Abraham. God spoke to Isaac. God spoke to Jacob. Over and over. God comes to Noah. Here's what's coming, Noah. Get ready. Over and over you see God 
initiating engagement with men. What was the big problem with the Tower of Babel? Man was building their way to heaven. What was it in Jacob's dream? God set his ladder, his staircase on earth. He initiated the relationship with man, right? We get it backwards sometimes. All through Genesis, we see that God is a God that initiates his relationship with human beings. And it helps us understand the gospel when we get to Romans and we start understanding that God, while we were sinners, died for us. God made promises to Jacob when Jacob was still referring to him as his father's God. Before Jacob had gone through the whole transition that we had talked about before, God initiates those things. Um, he initiated dealing with Cain and the sin. He initiated dealing with Adam and Eve after their sin. He's the one that comes walking in the garden seeking them. He's the one that comes down to Cain and asks the question, where's your brother? God didn't, didn't, he knew where his brother was. Later on he says, the blood of your brother's crying out from the ground, right? He, he knew where his brother was, but he, he's asking the question. He's the one that initiated that. Turn over to, look over in Romans 5. Let's look in verse 15. Romans 5 and verse 15. Again, my verse numbers are too small for my eyes. Here we go. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in the life through that one man, Jesus Christ. God is a covenant-making, promise-keeping God. He initiated that promise that through one man we would have redemption, and all we need to do to receive that free gift is turn to him. Do we see God selecting and initiating covenantal promises in the book of Genesis? Where do we see it? <laughs> right? 3, 6, 12, 15, 17, 22. <laughs> Over and over again in Genesis, what do we learn about our God? That he initiates making covenants with men of his choosing as the sovereign God. Many times where it is simply his delivering. Oftentimes mankind, when he makes a covenant with God, how does he do it? God, if you do this, then I'll do that. Right? Right? You don't have to look further than Jacob. He did that. Remember on his journey? If you bless me on my way, then you'll be my God. Right? That, that's the way man makes covenant promises. Not God. Abraham, go. I will make you. And, it, and he places it on him to execute. The same is true in our salvation. Christ does all the work. It's a free gift. It is given to us if we simply turn to him. God is a covenant-making, promise-keeping God. All right, let's look over um, Romans 3. Let's flip back to Romans chapter 3. We'll give you one more here under this category of God. Romans chapter 3. We're going to look in verse 19. 3.19 says this, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. God as sovereign creator has the authority to give commands and hold men accountable. Romans tells us, do we see that in Genesis? 
Where do we see it in Genesis? Well, certainly there's an example of holding them accountable, right? And they were doing the opposite of what God had commanded them, which was be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, right? Subdue it. God created all of it. And as soon as he put Adam and Eve in the garden, he gives them a command. Don't eat of the tree of fruit and blood. Don't, right? A don't do and a do do. <laughs> be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Right, um, and man disobeyed, and God held him to an account. And after Noah, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Right, man disobeys. God holds them accountable for their disobedience. And so, all through Genesis, we learn this truth about our God, which should cause us to think later when we're looking forward at what's to come. When sin comes, there's going to be an accountability. There's going to be a reconciliation of that. Okay? So, those are just a few. Anybody have a different one? New one? Something you can think of from Romans or elsewhere? I just stayed focused on Romans, by the way. We could have gone all over. We could have been in Ephesians. I mean, there's all kinds of New Testament truths. I just tried to stay in one book for now. Right? But Genesis prepares us for what we learn of God later by giving us that preview of these characteristics of God. Well, how about man? Let's go back to Romans chapter 1 again. Romans 1, let's look at verse 21. Right after, so, without, so they are without excuse. Although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God, or give thanks to him, but they came futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Romans chapter 1, verse 21 and 22. Does that sound familiar? The words that are used there? I'm not saying he's quoting Genesis. But look at the description of man's sin as it's laid out here. They knew God. They did not honor him as God. Could that be said of Adam and Eve? That's exactly. I mean, they, they, they refused to recognize him as God. They didn't give thanks to him for what they could have. They were focused on what they could not have. And they became futile in their thinking that they were going to become wise by eating of the forbidden true tree. Man didn't see fit to acknowledge God or to honor him. Look it down in verse 25. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Sound it all like Adam and Eve? You say, well, what creature? Themselves. They're still a create creature. They chose to honor themselves over the Creator. All right? Look down in verse 28. Since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, gave them, God gave them up to their debased mind to do what ought not to be done. Look down in verse 32. Though they know God's righteous decree, and that those that practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but get appro give approval to those who practice them. Did, God and, did Adam and Eve know God's righteous decree? Absolutely. What was the penalty? I'm coming right over to you, Sherry. What was the penalty that God gave to Adam and Eve if you ate of the tree? You're going to die. Right? Sound a little bit like verse 32. They knew God's decree. They chose not to follow it, not to hold that in their thoughts. They knew that the penalty was death, and they not only did it, but gave approval, at least Eve to Adam, of those others that would do it as well. Sherry, what'd you have for thought? Mm-hmm. 
Right. Yeah, that's good. Enoch in both uh, Hebrews and in Genesis, uh, you, you have the truths that uh, God took him. A righteous man, right? Comparison. A righteous man. All right, look in Romans chapter 132, right? They, oh, I already hit this. So they, they knew the decree, yet they disobeyed. They encouraged others to do so as well. Look in Romans 5. Romans 5, verse 12. Now here is obviously a direct comparison. We don't have to think too hard about this. Right? Romans 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was, was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Directly, we are caught up in Adam's own guilt. We're also guilty of our own volition. Um, look in Romans chapter 3, verse 9. Romans 3, 9. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God in their eyes. You see that in Genesis anywhere? Genesis 3, obviously, right? Where else? Oh, pre-flood, yeah, right before the flood, the wickedness of man was great in the earth, right? Sodom and Gomorrah, Tower of Babel, I already talked about that, right? Over and over again, you get this, you get this, their feet are swift to shed blood, their paths are ruin and misery, they have no peace, there is no fear of God, there is no acknowledgement of who he is. And, and the result then is death. Romans 6.23, Genesis chapter 3. Right? The result is death. There's a bunch of things there that you could list under your understanding of man that we get from Genesis and we see played out throughout the New Testament and, the, and leading to and pointing to the need of the Savior. Right? So here's the problem. God, sovereign creator, all-powerful deity, to whom we are accountable, his wrath is stored up against the sin of man. Man, continually and perpetually involved in sin, right? And then we get to the solution. Christ, look in Romans chapter 3. Familiar verses to us, but... Let's think these through a little bit and think about what we've been learning in Genesis. Romans 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. I'm going to pause here for a second because one thing that I didn't bring up. You know, when we were talking about God, does God reveal himself to us? He does. I talked about the initiation part of it. He initiates the relationship with us. But we have a God that desires to be known. And he doesn't just leave it like, you know, you guys figure it out. See, if it's, see it's a mystery. God is revealing himself to us over and over. He does that all through Genesis. I mean, that's kind of the point of what I'm pointing out here about him. And throughout Genesis, he's revealing his true character. Here again, we have it. Um, now the righteousness of God has been manifested, has been revealed apart from the law. God desires you to understand this. 
the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of of the one who puts his faith in Christ. By faith in Christ, we can be justified. Where do we see that in Genesis? You can cheat a little bit and think about Hebrews. <laughs> right? Abraham, by faith, was counted unto him as righteousness, justification. Right? Abraham is perfect example. And you can go through the rest of Hebrews 11 and see all the other Genesis characters and others who by faith, right? By faith in Christ they are to be justified. Um, we are saved from the penalty of sin. We're saved from enslavement to sin. And we are saved, we are reconciled to God. And that is all done by faith. We see that exercised in Genesis. Well, we talked about Abraham. Yeah, it's a good one. Do you see it in Cain and Abel's sacrifices? What made Abel's sacrifice acceptable? Yeah, it was Abel's sacrifice was honoring to God. It was given in faith, right? Not so much. Cain. Where else? Do you see this faith? Of course, we have the promise of Christ in Genesis 3, right? The promise of a deliverer that's going to come. All the Old Testament by faith, you know, it would have been those who were by faith looking forward to that deliverer who was to come. I shouldn't say all, like not everybody did, but those who were, were by faith looking forward to that day that that was going to be provided. Yeah. Yeah, right? Did he not exercise faith when he brought Isaac up and laid him on the altar? The whole way along the way. Me and the boy are going to come back. God's going to provide himself a lamb, right? Um, faith exhibited there. Noah building the ark and preaching. Somebody refresh my memory. Was it 120 years of building or how, how long was it that he was actually building that ark? 120 years? No. Think about that for a minute. For 120 years, you're standing there in beautiful daylight, sunshine and warm weather, San Diego weather, right? And building an ark because there's a flood coming. And you're preaching to people who have never seen rain. And you do it day in and day out for 120 years without a single piece of fruit. One single person believing and turning. No record of that. For 120 years you did it. Anybody tired and well-doing, you don't have to raise your hand. Anybody weary and well-doing? Think about Noah. <laughs> right? But by faith he kept doing what it is that God asked him to do. And it results in his deliverance from that catastrophe. Right? Where else do you see it in Genesis? Anybody else? New thought? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Abraham and Sarah waiting for their child, right? Now, you might argue their faith wavered a little bit with the, the whole, you know, concubine thing and things like that and trying to... But 
they uh, still believed God. The faith grew, didn't it, for them? All right. So lastly, on your sheet there, you've got this category of response. We know some truths about God. We understand the condition of men. We realize the promise of Christ, the promise of a deliverer. We realize that it's God that that is based on, dependent upon. What does the response need to be then? Faith. Turn to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, verse 18. In hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told. So shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, and when he was considered the barrenness of and when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. Greg Gilbert, in his book, What is the Gospel, makes this quote, and I like it. He says, faith is not believing in something you can't prove, as so many people define it. It is, biblically speaking, reliance. A rock-solid, truth-grounded, promise-founded trust in the risen Jesus to save you from your sin. Faith is rock-solid, truth-grounded, promise-founded in a person, in Christ. What did Abraham, what did his faith look like? He believed that God was able to do what he said he was going to do. And that is why it was counted to him as righteousness. It was a reliance, a dependence upon God's truth, God's word. We're counting on the righteousness that God provides as a result of our faith. Now, in the, when we consider the gospel, I don't want to stop just with the faith. Because there is another required response, and that's repentance. It's a reliance and dependence upon God, but there's also required to repent. You see that Romans chapter 2, 4, chapter 2, verse 4, 3, verses 21 to 25 that we just read a minute ago. Now here's maybe the toughest question. Where in Genesis might you see repentance? Sarah can't say. Because <laughs> we were talking about this yesterday. Where in Genesis might you see repentance? at least displayed. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, maybe. Maybe. That's not the one I was thinking of, but yeah, it could be. Yes. Thank you. Joseph's brothers. Right? At, now, it may not call it that, but at least in display, what you're seeing take place with Joseph's brothers is clearly repentance. And maybe the most, remember, what, what is repentance? I'm heading this direction. I'm going to forsake that. I'm going to turn around and I'm heading in a completely different direction. Right? I'm giving up one thing and turning to something else. You see that most displayed with Judah, uh, or is it Simeon? I got this messed up yesterday too, Judah, right? Who says to, to when they want to send Benjamin, if anything happens to him, it's my life for his. That's not where Judah was when it came to Joseph, right? Um, so you, you have this sudden turn, and these brothers who meant ill against Joseph are now dependent upon him and respectful of him at the end when you get to Genesis chapter 44. So that whole section of 42 through 44 and the exchange of the brothers and Joseph, you're seeing what repentance looks like on display. Now, it's not necessarily repentance to God like we think about our repentance for salvation, but you see, do see it displayed. I say all that to say this. When we go through the book of Genesis, what you are finding, at least in germinated form, in seed form, 
are these essential truths that are preparing you to understand the gospel that comes later. Truths about who God is, about who man is, about what sin is like, about the requirements of a salvation, and what the proper response to that is. It goes without saying, do you see the wrong response in Genesis? A response that does not include faith and repentance? We do, repeatedly. And what are the consequences then of a wrong response to God's requirement that we're held accountable? It's judgment. And you see it over and over and over again in Genesis. And it should help prepare us for the fact that the rest of the Bible is going to tell you that an all-powerful, holy God that has every right to make demands upon your life is going to hold you accountable. Questions? Thoughts? Not bad, we didn't get out too early. Helpful? When we read our, when we read our Old Testament, we especially when we read the first book of the Bible, let's not get caught up and like these little stories and think of them like a uh, like a book with chapters of different stories and we just read the story and we go on and maybe we take some sort of moral lesson from it there's, there's lots of that there I don't want to totally diss that but that when we read the book of Genesis it is filled with essential truths about these core doctrines that tell us and prepare us for all the rest of the Bible it's a critical piece of the whole that should open our eyes and excite us and energize us for the things that are yet to come and warn us if we're not on the right side of that history. All right, let's close in a word of prayer and I'll let you be dismissed. Lord, we do thank you for your word. Lord, I just um, struck as I consider just the fact that an omniscient, all-powerful, pre-existing God seeks to, initiates a relationship with sinful man. We see your long-suffering and your patience as you work with mankind, and we see that when we look in the, in the truths of the gospel throughout your word. So we thank you, we glorify you in your kindness to us, in your love for us, in your patience with us. Lord, help us, draw us to yourself, fill our hearts and minds with these truths, grow our faith as we've seen the faith of those patriarchs and others grow as, you, as they came to know you. Help us to, to fill our minds and our knowledge of who you are and what you've done, all to your honor and to your glory. I pray that this time has been profitable in your word. Thank you for the truths of the, the book of Genesis. Thank you for each one that has endured the 16, 13 weeks of our lessons. Lord, I pray that this will be something that they can germinate in their minds and that your spirit can use to bring great encouragement as they talk with others and as they look at their own Christian walk with you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name.